Hey, great sessions now being recorded. So welcome everybody to this season two, session two, um, iteration of Connect, Inspire, Share. Um, I am really happy to be able to say we've got a, a great presenter along today, Charles. Um, just to go over the format again, um, we'll just have this quick introduction. Um, Charles will give his presentation. We go into our breakout rooms to discuss that presentation and then come back and have our um, post uh, breakout room discussion Q&A uh, with Charles and, and we generally finish at five o'clock um, on the dot. Um, I'd like to start with an, an, an acknowledgement of country. It's a general acknowledgement. Um, so I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we all are today. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So to introduce Charles, um, Dr. Charles Savigny is a senior lecturer in the Department of Physiology and the Director of Digital Learning for the School of Biomedical Sciences at the University of Melbourne. After completing his PhD in Functional Neuroanatomy in the Department of Physiology at Melbourne in 2012, he became a teaching specialist with a focus on technology-enabled active and blended learning. In 2018, he launched the Virtual Reality Learning Studio, developing VR applications for biomedical science education and deploying them to cohorts of over 1,200 students. He now oversees the Digital Learning Hub in the School of Biomedical Sciences, which uses technology to enhance learning and collaboration of both students and academics with a focus on enabling, enabling digital fluency and empowering students to be co-creators and contributors to their learning experience in the global, at, and the global community. Um, in 2017, Charles won the university's David White Award, which is a prestigious award at, at UniMelb, for teaching excellence for enabling individual and collaborative learning in large cohorts, which is a, a great space to be awarded in. It's fantastic. And in 2020, he won the Australian Physiological Society's Michael Roberts Award for teaching excellence for his active engagement and excellence in teaching and learning, focus and development of digital learning modalities and recognition of outstanding pastoral care. Um, and I can also, again, as I said before, can attest to um, the quality of uh, Charles's um, uh, presentations and ideas. It's fascinating. So today, the subject of Charles's talk is reimagining, reinventing, and challenging traditional assessment approaches and academics perspective. So everybody, uh, please make welcome Charles Savigny. Thank you for that flattering intro, Steve. I couldn't have written it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> Well said. Um, thank you all. <laughs> thank you all for coming along today. Um, as I was just telling the folks before you joined us, I'm only back in the office for a few days, finally, uh, now after working from home. And you can see all my poor dead plants here behind me who have gone a year without water. But uh, these are problems we're all facing. Um, now, Steve asked me to come along today to uh, chat about um, some ways that I sort of threw traditional um, conceptions of um, assessment out the window um, when we were sort of forced to redesign things uh, during COVID. And we're all sick of hearing about COVID. But one thing I will say is that it, it, I feel like it catapulted us 10 years into the future in terms of our uh, the technologies that we were sort of forced to use suddenly that maybe we had avoided before because we didn't have time or we were rooted in our traditional methods. Um, and I think now all of a sudden, you know, we, we were forced to think outside the box. We were solving problems that had plagued us for years at a university in terms of efficiency and how best to use um, technology in our teaching. Um, but the things that I'm going to talk about today are actually very, very simple. The fight, despite my digital learning role, I always think that simple is better when it comes to students. So I want to take you through some of the things um, that I did and hopefully it spawns some conversation for you. Um, so to begin with, let me just give you a little bit of background. So the subject I'll be, uh, I convene a few subjects, but one of the, one, the main ones that I've convened for uh, since 2012 is called human physiology. And it's a second year subject. Uh, it used to be a prerequisite for graduate medicine. So it's always had very popular enrollments. Well, we get, it runs both semesters. We get between about 350 and 500 students per semester. Now, I point this out because strategies, obviously, for giving a meaningful experience to a large cohort are very different than those strategies for delivering a meaningful experience to a small cohort. And the reason this comes back in, in context for those in attendance today, I hope, is that 
students need to have a slightly different view on how to understand what they can get out of a subject like this um, in terms of their feedback and what they can get out of assessment. So we'll circle back and talk about that in a bit. But just to give you an idea of the structure of this subject, it's broad spectrum physiology. So there's a lot of information we need to get out there. Um, so we've got three lectures a week for the nuts and bolts information. And I make those as interactive dialogue based as possible um, with live polling, et cetera. Uh, and then every week we also have an inquiry based workshop. So students have a workbook and they work through questions together with their peers. And then we go through them together as a class. And they have an MCQ quiz every week that gives them feedback to help them consolidate their knowledge. And I'll drill a little bit deeper into this as we go through. Um, I give out of 48 sessions a, uh, a year, a semester, sorry. So that's three lectures and a workshop. I give 45 of them, um, which is sounds like a lot of work, but it's great for me because if I wanna change something, I just change it. I don't have to get 20 other people on board in order to do it. Um, so it gives me that agility to be able to sort of have ownership over the way that I like to, I, I prefer to run the subject. Sorry if that sounds egotistical, it just makes life a lot easier because my third year subjects have about 12 TNR academics involved in it and it's pulling teeth and hurting cats every single time you wanna change a small element. So this subject's always been really easy to manipulate. Now, this is a session about assessment, but I just wanna give you a little bit of the history here of sort of what led to it. So first we had these lectures, the workshops, um, interactive modules and a discussion board um, for students that sort of supplement the lecture content, these weekly online quizzes. And our tests and exams were on campus, MCQ tests, Wilson Hall, Royal Exhibition Building, your standard fill in the bubbles type tests. We transitioned to online. Um, the lectures went to online via Zoom and I still give them live because um, we're using live polling and all of that and that's worked really well. And I have a little sidebar to talk to you about that in a minute. Uh, the workshops, rather than being in a lecture theater with students sort of discussing things with their neighbors in the first half and then in the second half us going through things together, um, I encourage students to form their own study groups and then also um, would facilitate it for students who didn't know other people in the class. I basically have a Zoom group study session where they're welcome to join every week for an hour and I whack them into breakout rooms and they can meet people there to study together. Uh, and then the, the workshops are held live via Zoom. Uh, the weekly online quizzes ported straight over. But what I really want to talk the most about today is how I changed um, these MSTs in the EOS exam. Uh, but I'm going to give you a teaser on that one for now and come back to it in just a minute. Now, Steve, I know you told me to talk about assessment, but I couldn't, um, I couldn't help myself but have a little bit of a snack at what we're doing with lectures because I've got a graph here that I think you all will find really, really interesting. So we're running these live on Zoom. We're still running Poll Everywhere. Just a little bit of a nod. Is everybody fairly familiar with Poll Everywhere? It's live polling. You deliver it during your lectures. It looks like this. It gives you a lovely histogram at the end. It's a great technique, not only for students to sort of form, get formative feedback against their peers uh, and how well they're tracking the information. It's also great for me that if 80% of the class gets it wrong, I know I probably better back up and talk about that again. I run a very active chat box in these lectures. I always love dialogue based things. The, the chat box is always very active. It's always, what do you think would happen here? It's filling up with students, which is great. Uh, and I do draw a lot of drawing and annotation and things like that on the Surface Pro. So I try to keep these as interactive as possible despite being uh, online. Um, now here's the graph that I thought you might be interested in. So only because it took me ages for another seminar that I ran recently. So I wanted to reuse it again for you all. Um, here we have poll everywhere participation across the course of semester, okay? Now this is divided by the total enrollment. So sort of participation per poll per capita, if you will, in the, in the class. These three lines that you see completely overlap each other down here, the gray, the blue, and the yellow are three semesters that were taught face-to-face, -face, 2018 and both semesters from 2019. The orange line, now I've left out the first semester of 2020 just because that was half and half really because we transitioned halfway through. The orange line is wholly online semester two, 2020. Now, what I found really interesting about this is that you can see that the students started off so much stronger at the beginning of 2020 than they did in the previous years. But then there's always this sort of regression to the mean by the end of semester. Um, and I guess from an academic skills advice point of view, there is that 
you can see that things like mid-semester tests, which would have happened here, tend to really hit students and they immediately fall off in their immediate level of engagement. Um, and it happens every semester. This downward trend was no surprise to me at all. The orange line was a bit of a surprise. Um, but, you know, it sort of gives us a little bit of insight into how students behave, how they stay current with live lectures and how engaged they are, because there's opportunities here for them to stay engaged in the live performance, if you can call it a performance. Um, but that does end up falling off over semester as they get complacent or perhaps overwhelmed with work, etc. So I just thought that was an interesting little bit to show you there. Now, uh, I want to talk a little bit now about the various assessment that we've done. Uh, and so to put it in, in context of, of academic um, skills and student advising. Um, the CALs that I write, now these might seem quite old school, but I, I try my best to make them, uh, I guess all of my assessment strategy is underpinned by the idea of assessment, not just being about assessment and getting a number, but assessment being a learning experience. Let's get students to learn through their assessment. And the reason that I feel so strongly about that is is it's a, it's a little bit of a um, uh, steering into the skid, if you will, because as we know, there's this disconnect between academics who are here because we want students to learn and a lot of students who are here because they want the number at the end of semester that tells them that they've done well in the course, right? So students, from my experience, are really just laser focused on the assessment components um, and that the learning is just a means to an end for them. So what I've kind of tried to do here is hijack that in a way to say, well, let's make the assessment experience, let's sneak some learning into there as well and make it a learning experience also. So what I've done with these CALs, for example, these are com uh, computer assisted learning. So they're MCQs, they're done through Canvas. It doesn't sound very creative. Um, <clears throat> clearly I wrote that quickly. Uh, there's one set of them that's for sort of fundamentals. Do I understand the nuts and bolts about what we talked about this week? And then another set that's what I call applications. And that'll be a scenario they've never seen before, oftentimes because it's physiology, it's a clinical scenario or something like that. And they have to apply the things that they learned to answer those questions about that scenario. And the idea is to get them not just thinking about the nuts and bolts, but also about that application style uh, in, in understanding the material. I encourage them to work in groups for these. They're worth 2% each and they run every week, so I'm not that worried. Um, and the questions are set up in a way that um, sort of leads them through the material. We start off easy and then build on that as the questions progress. And so it's set up almost to be a learning experience for them. And then each question has paragraphs of feedback that I've written that students can then go back and look at after it closes. So I hope that they actually get a learning experience um, out of completing these weekly tasks. And it also, of course, encourages them to keep up with the material. Now, when I had to switch from um, when COVID came along, we couldn't do our big uh, Wilson Hall MCQ style tests anymore. And a lot of very talented colleagues were in a discussion board and we were really going back and forth on what's the best way to assess online questions that people like Greg Kennedy and David Israel up there and Chancellery have been asking for years because they want to make it cheaper to assess students, but I didn't say that out loud. Um, so we had to rethink things. And I sort of came up with what I consider these sort of inconvenient truths. Everybody was thinking, coming up with ideas, oh, we'll make a really short timed test, right? So students don't have a chance to talk to each other, or don't have a chance to, to um, uh, look things up. Okay. Um, but the way that I see it, no matter what you do, students are always going to be able to access resources in an, online, in an at home online test. They're always going to have some means of communicating with their peers. And if you say that they're not allowed to collaborate and they're not allowed to use additional resources, effectively what you're doing is punishing the honest students while the ones who are doing it anyway uh, are getting away with this. And also on top of this, in a large cohort, at least some of your students are gonna experience every possible issue they can with technology. I've got 500 students in the class, I guarantee you there's gonna be 20 internet dropouts is going to be, you know, whatever the case may be. So if you've got a short time to test, um, you're going to run into those problems. And the same thing with our overseas students in different time zones, etc. And, you know, a lot of people have offered this online invigilation solution, but I, I don't even think I need to talk about 
all the horror behind, you know, you need to be in a room by yourself at this time and our webcam can see everything in your room and see everything you do on your computer. It's highly invasive. It's, it's, it's just not an option. So rather than fight it, um, I decided to join it uh, in doing something that I call steering into the skid, which um, this is a Tuesday for me where I grew up in South Boston. You might not have had to engage in this maneuver here. Um, but the idea is that rather than saying, no, you can't collaborate, no, you can't use resources, I said, go ahead and collaborate. Use all the resources you want. So I've written short answer questions. They're open collaboration. They're open resource. They're open all day long. Okay. The test is written, the MSTs to be taken in about an hour and the final exam in about two hours, but they have 12 hours or 14 hours to complete it. It's not timed. They can take all 12 hours if they want. All they do is download a Word document, they write their answers in and they upload it again at the end of the day. Um, and basically these questions are written in a way that they actually, again, those sort of applications type questions that they need to think about the answer. They don't, they can't just regurgitate it from their notes. They can't just look it up on Google. The rules for this, the only rules are no plagiarism. So they run it through Turnitin, no open forums. So I don't want them to set up a massive Facebook group and discuss it with everybody in the class at the same time. And I encourage them to do that by saying, no, work in small groups. So you make sure you don't have any passengers in your group that are just copying down your ideas. And with a competitive cohort of students that generally that, that solves that problem. Um, no asking questions in Yahoo Answers, et cetera. And so we encourage them to keep the group small. And just in terms of the questions, to just give you an idea, and don't worry about the, don't worry about reading through this and the physiology involved. But here's a question, for example, uh, one of the questions which says, um, some of you may know, there's about four different, four or five different, broadly speaking, types of muscle fiber. I said you've got four of them in front of you in chambers and you need to design an experiment to figure out which one is which. Now, this isn't something they can plug into Google. This isn't something they can get out of their notes. They need to apply their understanding of these muscle fibers in order to come up with an experiment to determine which one is which. And what I found from all of these tests um, is, and, and it almost took me by surprise, is that students were getting back to me and saying, that was fantastic. We spent hours in my study group, four or five of us debating all of these questions, looking up information, whiteboarding things out, trying to put things together. This is what I'm talking about, about an assessment becoming a learning activity. These students are collaborating, they're researching, they're spending time and enjoying uh, what they're actually doing in this assessment, not just filling out bubbles on a test. Um, in terms of marking it, we made sure we were fair here. We had one assessor mark the same question across every single student and then another assessor marked question two, et cetera. So there's no variability. We didn't leave feedback on student papers and I, I lament that in some way, but we simply don't have time to do it with a class of 550 students or something like that. So what we did is we, I provide them with model answers and then the assessors go through and write extensive bullet points about where students went right and wrong. And that seemed to generally satisfy most students in terms of their feedback. So the big question I got after that, well, they're all collaborating and using open book tests. Did everybody get an H1? No. So if we can compare semester one, uh, 2020, when I ran this, compared to the old MCQ format, we can see, yes, the scores are a little bit higher, um, but not dramatically so. And as a matter of fact, with these scores previously, maybe I was being a little too hard on them. Um, so it was nice to see those come up a little bit, but no, not everybody got an H1. It wasn't an easy cruise through because my assessors have been instructed to make sure that they're reading the answers based on, does the student actually understand what's going on? Not just did they have the right keywords written there, but have they tied these concepts together well? Do they understand what's happening? And for anybody who's ever assessed something, you know that an MCQ gives you no real insight as to whether a student really understands it or they just recognize a word and select that answer. This really gives you insight into whether or not the student has their head around the concept. Uh, and that, I think, worked out really, really well because I think it's a more accurate reflection of a student's capabilities within the subject. So the pros, the cons, and the dons here. The pros were that it's easy to deploy 
Um, I didn't need to make adjustments for ADAs. I didn't need to uh, worry about time zones. I didn't need to worry about that. There's little policing required because there's no rules to police. Um, no stress about tight time windows, things going wrong. But the big, the big things that I, that I really took out of this was that these students were collaborating with their peers, they were discussing things, they were actively researching the material. So again, it turned into a learning experience. As I mentioned, the written responses highlight students who understand the material and reward them accordingly. Um, and anecdotally, they responded well to this. I think they really liked the flexibility. Um, they liked the feedback that they got on it. There's some downsides to this method, of course. Um, students with quote unquote good study groups were advantaged. Um, marking time and money, it's hard to write questions. Um, we had that issue of potential passengers in study groups and, and you can't really reuse tests. But I guess the rethinking here and um, to go back to Steve's um, original point is that this is sort of, yes, it's a test or an exam, but it's sort of a hybrid of a test and an assignment. And we always feel like we need to invigilate exams and we need to have somebody standing over their shoulder and making sure that they're the only person thinking and they're not using resources. But what time in life has somebody ever come up to you and said, what's the answer to this question? I need to know now and you can't go look it up or Google it. It's not how life works, right? You'll always have a textbook you can pull out. I don't care if they've memorized the name of a bunch of things. That doesn't tell me they understand the information. This format tells me that they understand the information. Um, so for me, uh, that's why this has become uh, something that I'm going to actually continue uh, well beyond, I think, um, just the COVID scenario. And I'm going to keep doing it um, indefinitely, I think, as long as the university lets me do it. Now, Steve, I may have gone a little bit under time here. Have I spent too little time? I can keep talking if you want me to, um, but I had some suggested con uh, topics for breakout rooms to guide discussion of people. Yeah, sure. No, keep it. going. You can uh, absolutely guide the uh, breakout room discussion, Charles. Go ahead. Uh, just some suggestions. So, uh, you know, how can students get the most out of their assessment? So, again, coming back to what I said earlier, a lot of students will view their assessment as just a number, um, but I think there are ways for them to view it as a learning experience, not just something that I set and then never look at again once I get a mark for it. Um, so looking at the, um, the group work, the efficacy of what we call learn it, do it, teach it, because getting students talking to each other about a concept, oftentimes one of them might have a misconception that all they need to do is have a simple conversation with somebody else and that gets clarified or try to explain a point and that gets clarified. So this idea of using assessment as a learning experience might sound great in a session like this, but it only goes as far as the students understand that that's the purpose of it and embrace that opportunity. So is there a way that we can better upskill students on learning how to value and get the most out of their assessment and get the most out of their feedback um, to appreciate what's happening there? Brilliant. Um, I also think, in addition to that, that um, perhaps one of the other questions for us in terms of breakout rooms is, is what's our role as advisors within this context of preparing students, if we have to, for exams, or what we have to say about this context of preparation of uh, students for exams. But um, I know we'll come out and uh, after the breakout rooms and have more questions for Charles, because what he says certainly prompts at least for me, I'm sure for you as well, a whole lot of questions because it's fascinating. He, his thoughts fly in the face in many respects of what is traditional pedagogy and thinking around um, exam taking within a university context. And I really loved what he had to say about where in life does anybody come up to you and say, give me the answer right now without asking anybody. And one of the Latrobe students at a talk we had out there, once she said it, you know, where in life does anybody lock you in a room for three hours and say, Here's a set of problems. You can't ask anybody. You can't even talk. You have to ask permission to go to the toilet. Um, and you're supposed to perform one of those, that situation. And the answer is obviously <laughs> nowhere. So um, I'm sure you'll agree with me that what Charles has to say in this space is refreshing. It prompts a lot of great thought. Um, and it's, it's super interesting. Um, uh, I'll stop talking now because it's not, <laughs> not the role of what I'm supposed to be doing here. Um, I'm going to pop you into our breakout rooms. Steve, can we, if anybody has any questions for clarification before we do that, I'm more than happy to answer them, but that's up to you. You're the chair here. Um, yeah, I don't mind, uh, Charles, if there's anything you need to clarify before we go to the breakout rooms, anybody? 
Yeah, I think we're all pretty good with that, Charles. But um, what we will do is have the breakout rooms for around about 25 minutes to half an hour. That's usually what we do. And yeah. then we'll come back and if we can do a little bit of dis post breakout room discussion and some Q&A with Charles, um, he's more than happy to hang around uh, till five o'clock and uh, answer our questions. Um, all right, so I'm going to pop you into the breakout rooms uh, now and... There we go. Happy discussions. Steve, are you happy if I just pop out? I'll stay in the session, but just pop out for about 20 minutes. And no problem at all. Back. Is that all right? Totally fine. Need, yeah. No, 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 no. We'll be back at around, if you pop back in at around, say, 420. Yep. Sounds good. Or 425, you know, just in case people are, are coming back. Yeah, that's fine, Charles. That's great. Thanks. No problem at all. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And Leslie, Frederic, are you going to join a room? Oh, I'm sorry. I had trouble um, joining before and I've only just joined now. So um... Um, you're in room one, Anne. So if you can pop in. Oh, she's, is she gone? Oh, she's still here. Sorry. Yeah, you're in sorry. room one, Anne. Sorry, Steve. This is Leslie. I'm actually doing some all stuff on the side. So I probably aren't going to discuss with anyone else. <laughs> I've just been listening while sure. I'm doing something else for okay. all. So, um, yep, sorry, no it's probably better if you don't pop me into a room. No problem. Or maybe I could and just tell them I'm not going yes, to. Yes, that, that might be a good idea. And you can leave your video off and mute yourself. That would yep. be great because I think Ellen and I. So, gonna, which yep. room? I think um, I was in room three, but I can't room find three. it now. Um, I'll just move you to room. Oh, no, I can't. Um, you, should, you should be able to have an option on your screen saying join the room. I think I closed that. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I um, don't know how to make you rejoin it. <laughs> I'll put you. Look, I'll put you into a different. No, no, I'll put you into a different room. You're in room two now. There you go. You okay, should get the thing. Thank again. you. Thanks, and Steve. I'll, Sorry about that. And I'll just wait, Steve, because I've got other things to do too, and listen to the discussion afterwards. Sure. Okay. Um, all right. That's fine. Um, do you want to mute yourself, Anne? I'll just um, Eleanor. I'll have a bit of a. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm okay. Just, no worries. Um, wait a minute. Let me see where I am. Mute. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, why won't it let me do that? Okay. Um, yeah, so um, Siri got back to me and said, uh, you know, with, with a couple of competing things on and she wants to hear a, an upcoming, what it was, I could email it to you, but an upcoming talk, I think, by Sally and someone else on something, which she feels is going to inform what she says at the next thing. And she was wanting to recommend someone for the next one. Are you okay with that? And then she does the following one. So she she wanted to suggest another speaker for, for the next one, yeah? Yeah, and I, I said that was okay. So I, I'm hope, yeah. I hope you're okay with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. And Steve, what I was thinking, maybe um, what's now very end of uh, April, what do you think about early June? around the you know, 8th of June or 10th of June, just to, to give people a little bit of time because it seems to be from attendance, because we do quite frequently, you know, the, the interest started, you know, a little bit. Oh, gee, I should stop recording. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Just Everyone, welcome back. I think everyone's back now. We've got two people in Nicholas's room. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah wonderful. Make a note of that for your metrics, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always after numbers, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Got to have those numbers. Doesn't matter what we do as long as we got the numbers. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Look, I hope everybody enjoyed the discussion. It was a wonderful presentation given by Charles and the, well, the, the topic is extremely. Sorry, uh, Elena, can I just break yep. in for a second? We've, we're still waiting for a, a couple of breakout rooms and to come now. back in. Oh. They should be, yep, here they come, here they come. They pile oh, back, so pile, roll back in like uh -huh. oranges. <laughs> not, All right. Not a couple, Steve. It's just a whole bunch. Lots, of <laughs> whole bunch, whole bunch. Exactly. With yeah. Lots of questions. Lots of questions. Lots of comments. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, that's exactly. That's the time. So let's start. If you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and speak. You don't need to raise your hand. Just unmute and. I have a quick question. Sorry, I, I don't want to hog the floor as the chair, but um, Charles, can, right. I, can, I, can I ask? I'm really interested to hear what you have to say about how the rest of the staff bought into your philosophies around how you conducted the online 
um, exams. I'll be fascinated to hear about that. In terms of it's more about be... Charles. It's probably about your influence and skills. That's the question about your influence and skills. Well, I have fifteen hundred followers on Instagram. Uh, <laughs> so it's a different type of influencing, right? Um, <laughs> I uh, look. Uh, I haven't had to get staff to buy into it, Steve, because. Um, because I'm the only one that really teaches into that subject. <laughs> uh, the only other person that does is actually my boss, the head of department here of anatomy and physiology. And um, it was interesting to see because he, respects to him, he's not a regular teacher, he's a T&R. Um, and he didn't quite get on board quite as well with the writing questions that weren't Googleable. They were still sort of very kind of fact-based questions. And... You know, that wasn't the best, but we could improve those. Um, in, a, in a third year subject that I'm doing now, though, we're doing something very similar. Um, so this is a third year subject called Advanced Human Physiology, uh, which is more of a parade of stars type um, subject. We've got a different person doing a different topic each week. And in that subject, every week, students have to do still the MCQ type things, but they also have to do what we call a challenge question. And it's about 300 to 500 words. It's an essay question. They submit it through Canvas. Um, and again, it's about applying their understanding. So think about one of these challenge questions as being very similar to what I was presenting on my tests. But this time they have to do one every week and a different academic has to write it. Um, and they've actually done really quite well with that. Uh, and the format there is that every week they also have a workbook the students and they can work through those workbook questions with their peers. And the workbook questions sort of lead them to the challenge question, right? So they're kind of leading questions that get them to the challenge question. And then again, the challenge question, they can work with their peers to take as much time as they like, and we have those assessed as well. And the others have actually jumped right on board with that. And what I've found a lot, especially in a third year subject, and I can't speak for all disciplines, but within mine, a lot of the academics are always complaining that I can't write MC, I can't assess what I'm teaching with MCQs. Um, and it is very challenging to craft a good MCQ. You end up with all these MCQs that are frankly a series of true false statements. Mm. And I, I hope I don't offend anybody in saying this, but I hate these types of MCQs. Mm. Which of the following is correct? And then it's just a whole bunch of disconnected statements, right? Yeah. Which of the following is not correct? <laughs> okay. You know, a, a good MCQ, you should by the end of the STEM be already able to craft what the answer is in your head before you read the options, right? So that aside, mini whinge, sorry. Um, I think they were actually quite happy to be able to write questions like this where they could actually get students to think about things and showcase their thinking about things in a written response rather than an MCQ. Um, the big one was just always convincing them that marking was gonna be okay. And I looked at my head of department and I said, this is how much it's going to cost to mark all of these things over the entire semester for my subject of 400 students. I said, it's the equivalent of the EFTSOL that we will get out of three enrollments in the subject. So if I just waive the prereqs for three more students, can I just hire assessors? <laughs> Are you talking about a subject with 500 students in it, right? I mean, you know, when you present it that way, they, they, they struggle to say no to spending $5,000 on marking a subject that brings in $7.1 million a year. Wow, nice. Um, so you know your numbers. Up. Yeah, very, very solution. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but no, I had no problem with buying. In fact, um, they jumped right on. Yep. Great to hear. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Questions, questions, questions. Yes, Anna, feel free to unmute yourself. And um, Anna's in the Thank car. you. Thanks a lot for this wonderful presentation. I'm sorry, I'm not very professional looking at the moment, and I couldn't even set up professional looking background <laughs> but I really wanted to be here today and I'm glad I came so there were lots of questions from our group I was um, um, you know in a group with Guida and Rosemary and Leslie so we wanted to see what the take up was in terms of individual versus group work preparation do you have any data on that I wish I did um, unfortunately I don't because I don't monitor that stuff actively. Um, I can only report sort of anecdotally what I know. Um, and from what I understand, the students are getting together primarily groups of five or six students each um, and working through it. And I think they set time aside to do that. Um, and I had some groups of my super keen students by the end saying, oh, you said it should be done in 
45 minutes, but we took all 12 hours to do it. And I said, that's awesome. You spent all day debating these questions and looking things up. And that's great. Yeah. I think there were some that probably, you know, would have been sort of more the loner type who went straight at it. But I, I hope that the students can immediately see the advantage of doing this as part of a group. And um, it was only once that I had a student say, because I submitted individually, right? Not as a group. So I only had one student that said, oh, I don't really know anybody in the class. I feel a bit disadvantaged. And that's when I brought in that optional uh, group study session, which is just come along. I'll put you in random breakout rooms. You can meet people and have a chat with them from there and then form study groups. So, but unfortunately, I don't know. I don't have data on. Uh, okay. That's okay. Students. Next time you will, I believe. Uh, in, uh, <laughs> okay, I'll start improvements. That. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> and, and, and everyone, I'm very sorry, but my question has three parts and it's a group question. So it's not just me. So okay. how many words was that submission that needed to be marked? Um, so the tests will have, the mid-semester tests have about four questions on them. And I ask for about 250 words per question. So you're looking about a thousand words thousand? all up okay. for the test. Yep. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And with in terms of them working in groups and then submitting individual responses, did Turnitin have a problem with any similarities? Um, no, is the short answer. And um, the longer answer is that, you know, students were, I had a student who was very anxious about this um, because I have a front page on my test that's very, we take plagiarism really seriously, you know, don't even think about it. Um, he said, oh my gosh, what if we, you know, if we worked on this in our group, how is it going to be? So I've put up very front and center some advice and said, look, in your groups, don't sit together and craft the perfect answer, right? Because you're going to put yourself at risk. Sit as a group, talk about the concepts, take your own notes, and then craft the answer in your own words. Um, so whether or not they all did that, I don't know, but we didn't have much problem with plagiarism across students, no. And the last, the last question, all related to this. So what you've been saying, it looks like you've tried to scaffold the group skills, mm -hmm. uh, group working skills, group work skills. So did you have like a separate um, workshop on that or list of tips or stuff like that? Because it's one thing you say something like, you know, don't let anyone to go for a free ride and don't do this, but... Yeah. How did you approach that? Anna, that's a really great question. And it, it touches on something that um, Steve, Elena, and I were, were talking about um, offline while you were all in your great breakout rooms. And actually, you just called me out on the thing that I said, I, it annoys me when other people do it, um, which is when we assess students on skills we haven't taught them. Um, I said one of the big ones we do, I was telling them before, is, is oral presentations where we just tell a student to do an oral presentation without actually training them in how to do it. Uh, group work is another one. We tell students to go off and do a group project without giving them any training in group work. Um, and in my department and in the discipline around me, we've worked very hard at making sure that we do that. But actually, you've just called me out because I'm not doing it in my subject. It wasn't something that I started doing in this quick transition to COVID. Um, but it's a great, it's a great point. I guess the difference in this scenario is that I'm not actually assessing them on their group work. I'm assessing them on the outcome of a group discussion. But I think what you're saying is really valid. It wouldn't hurt to have a module or something like that, or even a session just suggesting how they work together in groups. So I'll, I'll take that on board. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Charles. Moving on. Any comments from other groups? Just, yeah, I'd, I'd just yeah. like to make a comment that in a sense, Charles, I kind of like the idea that with that kind of arrangement, students are working as study buddies. And the silent person who's not a, who doesn't contribute, um, I like the possibility that they don't have to that they can kind of be there and listen to the argy-bargy and be a little bit slower in the way that they might be conceptualising or building a picture of what's going on. And that, um, and that they might even be the person who's asking the, why do you think that? Or what does that mean? Or, and that that's all available to them in that kind of group setting. Um, because it's not, 
Yeah, because it, you're not talking about a group outcome. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I really like the idea that groups can be what, you know, however they determine themselves to be. And I, I really you. love that I, I as an activity. You raise it. I mean, group work is a, is a whole other conversation for a whole other day, but I'll, I'll keep this as brief as I can. Uh, one of my colleagues is, is very, uh, An Angelina Fong, and if you're ever interested in doing something on group work, I'll, I'll put you in touch with her because she's the, the guru around here. Um, one of the main issues that I've seen from students about group work is that they don't mind the work. They just hate sharing their grade with other people. They hate relying on people in their group for the final mark they're going to get. And they don't seem to mind things where they're encouraged to work in groups, but they get an individual mark for it at the end because they feel like they have ownership of their own mark. The previous system where, you know, it's a big group mark, they consider that quote unquote high risk um, because you just you don't have con direct control over it yourself. So I think this uh, what I like about this, as you sort of pointed out, is that it's a great way to get them working in groups without feeling that they have to work in groups and without feeling like they're dependent on their group members. Yeah. Because the value of group work, I, I don't need to tell you all. Um, and now even they're doing all the job interviews are all done in groups um, and seeing how people work together. Even internships at Royal Melbourne Hospital are done in groups, yeah. Thank you so much, Thea. That, that's a great question about group work, but it, it's, it's not a traditional way of doing group work. It's sort of, you know, subtle approach and way um, makes them see the value of group work for themselves it, rather than it, me it, trying to tell them that it's valuable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That they could sort of find out that for themselves without being, you know, stuck in writing a reflection on how the group work went. So that's that's a very good point. Thank you so much, Jen and Charles. Um, other groups or group members or um, comments or questions from anyone? I, I just wanted to say that I um, once had a job interview to work with the Quakers in Cambodia and the job interview required me to be with all of the other candidates in this sort of big house for a weekend where we had to cook together and eat together and um, sit around together. Oh, it was a nightmare. <laughs> Is there a mysterious voice that called itself Big Brother that moved you around the house? Yeah. <laughs> It's sort of you voted, a version, you voted, yeah. got voted off one at a time. <laughs> a version of Big Brother, yeah. Um, Charles, I, I've got a question. You, in in terms of the exam questions, you said it's quite difficult, quite challenging to craft those questions. Yeah. But my my question is about marking and assessing the answers, yeah. because also what I heard in your speech, you said. Um, the the questions they check application and students need to to do research to come up with a solution. Um, in terms of marking, do you have only one acceptable solution per question, or a question is pretty much a room for interpretation? And well, and then it's a room for interpretation for marking, whether it's high distinction or credit, whether it's right or wrong. I know it's a very tricky question, but if you can answer, would be appreciated. No, I can answer that. So it, it depends. Mm. Some, some questions are a lot more open-ended than others, right? The one that I, the example I gave you about figure out, design an experiment to figure out which muscle fiber is which, there's a million different ways they can approach that. So how did I resolve that with the assessor? I made sure I got somebody who knew exactly what they were talking about to assess that. I made sure that they watched my lectures so they knew that the information that the students got and I had a chat with them about different approaches the students may take um, and said, beyond that, I don't care if it actually would or wouldn't work in the lab. If their logic is sound, then I'm happy with that, right? Other questions I ask will probably have more of a one right answer um, type of outcome. Um, but again, I'm very open and I tell my assessors to be open that if their logic is sound in the physiology, um, that, you know, they might not get a perfect score for that answer, but it should be, it should hold up. Um, so basically they get marks for showing their work, if you will. Um, 
but depending on how open-ended the question is, it, it sort of depends on how um, expert an assessor you need uh, to be able to understand that the student has thought outside the box to come up with a different solution, but that's still perfectly okay. Yeah, and fortunately I have access to PhD students across the physiology department who are experts in a range of these topics. Do, do students challenge the, the marking, the marks, their marks, and how often? Um, the, the same student, student challenges every mark <laughs> the whole <laughs> semester. Uh, you get you get small pockets. Um, you're asking me at an interesting time right now because I, I just on Friday released the marks from the first midsum. I've had four emails. Um, one of them was perfectly fair. They said, I got a zero for this question. I don't understand why. And I went and looked and I said, there's no reason. And the assessor said, oh my goodness, I missed, I missed that student's question. Uh, so, and the other three, one of them was, um, I marked my own paper and gave myself a higher mark. And I said, Good you. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> but I mean, you look at this and it wasn't, you know, uncharacteristic, you know, each question was worth about eight points and the student had gotten a three on every single one of them. And you're saying, I look, these are four different markers that have all given you a three out of eight on four different questions. Chances are, I hate to say it, but you're a three out of eight student um, <laughs> on this topic. So look, I, you know, most of them I don't worry about. I get few enough that I, that I do have a, an opportunity and I often will, depending on how busy I am, is to have a quick peek at the student answer to see if anything is completely untoward. But nine times out of nine, I look at it and I end up concurring with the mark they got. Yeah, mm -hmm. it really minimizes it. It really minimizes the pushback when you tell them that one assessor did that question for every single student. Because the biggest complaint you normally get is, oh, I had a harsh assessor. Well, no, you had the same one that everybody else did. Right. Right. So that minimizes that variability. Mm -hmm. And even though that's brutal for to ask one person to mark 400 papers, um, it, it, it keeps it as fair as you possibly can, in my opinion, with with subjective marking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a very good approach. Very strong approach. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've got in a bit of a well, a reverse question to the room um, that uh, Charles, I'm not sure you're aware that um, m most of the people in the room are not from uh, University of Melbourne, they're from different universities around um, uh, Australia. Um, are there any other people? Sorry for my attitude of, oh, I didn't know there were other universities. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Very University of Melbourne. Just, you, were, you were dropping names of I thought people don't know who he's talking about here. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, are there any other advisors who have come across um, academics who are taking similar views of um, assessment to what Charles is doing. By that, I mean that break away from the traditional lockstep exam methodology. I'd just be interested to hear if this is something which is happening in other places. Because it's not widespread at Melbourne Uni. I'm not saying we're, we're ground zero for a revolution, but uh, Charles is doing something. <laughs> I don't want to be ground zero for a revolution. <laughs> Nicholas, um, well, Nicholas. Yeah, I might just share that currently I'm working with the... Um, architecture group here at Griffith and they're really trying to revitalize their program in 2022 because surprisingly universities are being a bit more rational with their money so you've got construction management architecture and environmental and urban planning all going to be doing studios so they're trying to make sure that the assessments they're doing are authentic and we did a workshop last week looking at how we can replace exams as an assessment to obviously reduce that academic integrity issue that Charles has, you know, negated with his work, which is great. I know other universities have similar concerns. Um, so we've just been, you know, talking about the different opportunities to assess students without doing exams. And obviously the budget constraint always, you know, appears in the background. So I think I would have bounce those ideas amongst themselves and share the ideas it was really useful last week and trying to be innovative and then make them still realistically achievable within your budget constraints. Well, one, one concern that I'll add on to that, and thanks for that, Nicholas, is that um, <clears throat> a, a condition that one needs to consider is accreditation. And oftentimes you can't get a course accredited unless you have invigilated exam. Can you take them out? And I think, you know, that, that tells you something about the way they see how to, you know, uh, how accreditation works. Again, as 
Steve was saying, you know, we don't, we don't say, never in life are you locked in a tiny room, unable to talk to anybody, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, that is something to consider, but um, nobody's pulled me up on it yet. So, but I imagine if you were doing a course in medicine or something like that, that it might be a bit more, you know, it might be something you need to consider, but yeah. So, um, but yes, um, it, the university does like it now because it saves them money. Uh, they don't have to have gigantic exam venues and all of this kind of stuff like they have before. And everybody likes it because it saves you a lot of hassle around test time. It really does. You're not scanning papers. You're not, you know, um, things slipping between the cracks, everything else. It's just nice and straightforward and simple. Yeah. I think Siri has a hand raised. Hey, Siri. Hi, Charles. <laughs> Thanks for that. That was really interesting. And you know, we had a great discussion in our breakout room as well. Um, I was uh, wondering um, about a couple of things. And, and they are around, we get a lot of really stressed students around exam time. And I'm wondering um, about one way to, to possibly be promoting this kind of um, assessment. Um, but, I guess it's a question though. Um, do you find that you have the same um, number of requests for special consideration, for example? Are there issues around student well being? Are you getting students committing suicide because, I mean, these are problems yeah, no, that, absolutely. That, that happen across our universities when students are under a lot of stress. Yeah. And I'm just wondering um, are you able to show you know, increased satisfaction, increased well being? Um, I don't know if I can show increased satisfaction, increased well-being. I, I don't have, I just, just because I don't have the metrics, Siri. Um, I, I will say before I go any further that I'm a huge advocate for student mental health here at the university. So it is something that's very, that I'm very close to and, and, and try to stay very in tune to. I'll say that um, special considerations are way down, way down over, you need to turn up for one hour with this person staring at you while you fill in this, these 30 MCQs and you need to get it done in time and everything else, way down. I mean, I'm talking from, you know, we used to get probably 20 to 25 spec cons for a, for a mid-semester test. Now we get two. Um, and I think a lot of that is, you know, also I didn't have problems with the train coming in to my test. I didn't have, you know, any of these other issues. I had 12 hours to do this. So if something went wrong, it wasn't the end of the world. I had time. I wasn't stressed about that. I could use my book. I didn't have to worry about, oh my gosh, what if I forget the difference between apoptosis and necrosis? I don't need to worry about that because I can look it up, you know? So I think it, Anecdotally and based on the SPECCOM numbers, I think it's actually been less stressful to have this sort of thing for students. Um, but beyond that, Siri, I don't have I don't have the metrics on it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, I can tell you that students liked it. The um, student yeah. experience surveys were through the roof. Um, so those I do have metrics on, but um. <laughs> Oh, that, that's really great, um, because I guess these are things that are also taken into consideration when you're trying to, to, to shift people's practices. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think it's, it's a really important point that you've made, um, mm -hmm. and one that I should probably focus a little bit more on when I'm pitching the idea. <laughs> I, I was, um, I sort of had a general question, if I can, if it's, Steve, it's okay if I, and Elena. Yeah, I think we'll make this I the last question. Something. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, fine. I'll just, I'll, I'm just going to pop some, I'm just going to pop some metrics up on the board here. So this is in blue, oh. the, this is in blue, oh. is my subject. And then we've got cool. the university average and the faculty average. So, I mean, you look at the scale down here, that's four and a half and five. So, um, wow. nothing under a four. Um, so the students were, Congratulations. Happy happy yeah. Right. I mean, that's about what we see we saw beforehand as well, but it was nice to see that we didn't have the big drop that most subjects did during during COVID. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, brilliant feedback. Yeah. <clears throat> I guess my question is, um, uh, in your breakout groups or, or now, um, what does everybody think in terms of the role of academic language and learning support for a unit like that? Is there a role? What would it be? Uh, I don't know, Charles, whether you um, send students to services like ours or? Uh, I, I'm very 
I make very sure that students are aware of those services from lecture one. And then after every test, when I send them, I send them a mail merge after the test. So all students know what they scored on every question, et cetera. And at the end of that, I said, you know, are you experiencing difficulties? If it's academic difficulties, here's the link to academic skills. If it's personal issues, here's the link to disability support. If it's this, then you might want to check this out. Here's counseling and psychological support. So I make sure that they have all of those resources at their fingertips. Um, but I mean, again, I'm, I'm leading them to water there. Um, beyond that, whether they drink is up to them. Um, mm -hmm. We have seen a lot in, and I don't know the practice in other universities, but at Melbourne Uni, we have uh, what's called CAPC, CUPC, which is Course Academic Progress Committee. So students that are doing poorly um, and have failed a few subjects, they have a meeting with a panel. And oftentimes on that panel, will you can tell within about three seconds that it's a language issue. Um, and then, you know, we have a course at Melbourne Uni called Academic English, I think it's called, um, that, you know, we can refer a lot of students to to help them with that as well. Yeah. Just think, add to that question. Sorry, it's the same question, Anna, Steve. It's um, <laughs> whether you assess them on the academic language side of things. Like, if, you're, if your marker is and they're really struggling, will that affect their grade? So I've always told my assessors, this isn't, this isn't a, a grammar test um, and it's not an English language test, but the answer needs to make sense. So I don't mind if the grammar is a little bit off or something like that, but if, it's, if the question is, I mean, even if it is a language issue, but it's phrased in such a way that you absolutely, you, you really don't know what this student is saying. And look, that's a very small minority, but they do pop up. Uh, you, you simply can't give them marks for that, right? They need to be able to communicate this in English. That's a, a University of Melbourne requirement, not a, not a me requirement. But again, it's not a, like, I've told, like I said before, it's, I, I tell them it's not a grammar test. I don't, I don't mind that kind of stuff. It's a physiology test. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's uh, probably about time to... Um wrap up today. Um, I've popped in the chat um, a feedback link that we do every time. We'd <clears throat> love to hear your feedback and thoughts on today. Um, can you, everybody, join me in giving a big um, thank you to Charles? I, I think that was a fascinating and thought-provoking talk, Charles, uh, in the same way that you gave last time. I, not in the same content, but in the same way you stimulated thinking. Uh, for me and everyone here, I, I think it's fantastic. I loved it. Thanks very much for having me. I'm happy to come back anytime you want me. Thank Thanks, you so Charles. much. Thank you, Charles. And thank you very much to everyone for joining us today. And there will be another email about our next session. Uh, we're thinking about mid or early mid June. So please keep on checking your emails. There will be one from us at some stage. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Charles, again. Appreciate that. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. All right. Um, Siri, you'll be in touch about um, the proposed person for next time? I will. I definitely will. And about right. the timing. So there's a lot happening in May as well. Yeah, we're thinking early June, actually. June, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's June. good. Because um, Meet the Author is now 7th of May, and then the iCald one's going to be on the 21st of May. Okay, so early June probably yeah. works perfectly then. Yeah. Siri, yeah. maybe this week, starting the 7th of um, June, maybe... Um,